songs and hope y'all enjoy the service on today. Amen. Because everything we do, we do as unto the Lord that he get the glory out of all our lives. Amen. Amen. The Bible said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So we come in here to get fueled up today. And then when we go out into the hedges and highways tomorrow, somebody will see the light. And they'll know that we have been in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. 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 All right, praise the Lord, everybody. This is the part of service that everybody can participate in. It ain't all for y'all. It's the opening song, so y'all can stand up on your feet if you want to. You can put your hands together. However you worship the Lord, come on and help us this morning. Because God has been good to us. The Bible says the race has not been given to the swift or the strong, but to those who are good to the end. So you got to fight on. Praise God.
will fight on. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Good morning, First Baptist. Good morning. We welcome you today in person and online. We uh, bring greetings to you from our pastor, First Baptist Church, Reverend Dr. Lowry, First Lady Eva Lowry, our deacons and trustee ministry. We welcome you here today, and we say happy golden anniversary. Amen. 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 Praise God. Our scripture today is taken from 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, beginning at the fourth verse. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes always preserves. Love never fails. Amen. Love never fails. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, heavenly and wise God, we come before you, God, with bowed down heads and uplifted hearts, oh God. We come before you, God, because we are people, God, that have sinned, God. And Lord, we thank you for being a forgiving God. So we come to you, God, asking for forgiveness right now of all our sins, all our unrighteousness, oh God. Lord, you said you would throw them into the sea of forgiveness, oh God, and bring them back no more. Now, who wouldn't serve a God like that? Oh God, we worship you, God. We thank you for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, oh God how you allowed us to wake up this morning to another bright sunshiny day oh god a day we've never seen before a day we will never see again but god this moment this second we're gonna praise you god we're gonna lift you up god we're gonna thank you god we're gonna worship you god with all our hearts with all our minds with all our soul, God. Oh, God. But, Lord, we realize that there are some that are laying on their sick bed of afflictions, God. Don't know which, which way to go, God. Lord, the doctors have given up on them, God. But, Lord, we know that you are the physician of all physicians, God. And you know when, what, where, and how. Oh, God. And, Lord, we ask that they will call on you, God. Oh, God, the God that never fails. Oh, God. And, Lord, we realize that some have gone through deaths in their families, oh, God. Whether through violence of shooting, God. Whether through fires, oh, God. Whether through sickness, oh, God. Whether through suicide, oh, God. Oh, God, we ask that you will move on every leaning side, oh God. Lord, heal the hurting hearts right now. Oh God, save that sinner that's thinking about ending their life right now, God. Oh God, we ask that you will go into the hedges and highways, God. Go into the prison centers, oh God. In the juvenile centers, oh God. Lord, our boys and girls are all confused and don't know which way to go and don't know which way to turn, God. But Lord, lift them up right now, wherever they are, wherever the circumstances may be, whatever the situation is, God. Lord, touch and let them know that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all things, oh God. And we thank you for deliverance, God. Devil, you is a liar, yes. and the truth is not in you. We bind you up, Satan, yes. as God loosed 
the chain of the broken heart, of the disadvantage, oh God. Lord, we thank you right now for being a delivering God, for being a savior, God, for being a healer right now in the name of Jesus. And we count it done, and we praise the victory in Jesus' holy name. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's give God some praise. After the next song by the praise team, our pastor will come up with remarks.
I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I Good morning, First Baptist. And good morning to our visiting friends. Praise God. They're about to shout me up here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We are so happy to be here in the house of the Lord one more time. I like to say this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Are you glad to just be in the house of the Lord one more time? Just one more time. Oh, he's been good to us just one more time. Praise be to his name. He is worthy to be praised. I don't know about you, but he's watched over me when I slumber and slept. And I'm here by the grace of God. I want to thank Minister Robinson for her leadership this morning in terms of opening up this service. She does a wonderful, wonderful job. Appreciate her so much. And thank you for the associate ministers and the deacons and all that are involved in terms of getting this service. And thank you one and all for being here today. We just want to give you a few announcements. Don't forget, uh, early voting is over. It ended yesterday. But voting, or, or, uh, but the actual last day to vote is on Tuesday. So if you did not meet the early voting period, please do not take this for granted. If you are eligible and you have already registered and so forth, make sure that you vote on Tuesday. Go to your precinct sink, and vote. It's very, very important. Very important that we vote. Don't forget that we will have church conference immediately after church on Sunday uh, the 22nd, uh, Sunday the tw which is next Sunday. Uh, after service. For those of you that are members of First Baptist Church, please remain uh, for a while for our church conference immediately after service. At this time, I'm going to take a moment for these wonderful ladies and gentlemen who are part of the Golden Circle, and they're going to come forward. And uh, I, I heard somebody say golden. I don't know how many years it's been. I know it's been 90-something. It may have been 100. I don't know. I guess they'll tell us the historical aspect of it. So let's just take a moment and hear what these individuals have to say regarding Golden Circle. Let's say amen. amen. Let's give them a hand clap of praise as they come. celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Golden Circle Ministry. Amen. The ministry is a God-given and God-guided one whose objective is to keep the general look of the church's interior adorned with attractive floral arrangements, whether in general or on special occasions. Therefore, the members of the ministry seek to honor God's house of worship, both spiritually and aesthetically by beautifying the interior of the church in a manner pleasing to God and appealing to both church members and visitors in keeping with our initial objective. To do this, we commit ourselves to the following. We will beautify the church with flowers because we serve a living God. We will ensure the church has beautiful flowers during worship services and on certain religious holidays. For example, Easter lilies and palms on Resurrection Sunday and Poinsettias at Christmas. We ensure the altar is always adorned with flowers. Ch 
church members may provide flowers for the pulpit by contacting Ms. Lucy Munn or any Golden Circle ministry member in advance. Thank you to the Winston and Trice families for the floral arrangements you see here today. Well, how did this ministry get started? In the summer of 1952, due to the tenacious efforts of 10 women, Ms. Lizzie Bass, Ms. Joe Evelyn Burton, Ms. Alla Harris, Ms. Larsa Sanders, Ms. Elo Zola Speed, Ms. Christina Street, Ms. Madge Holland Burton, Ms. Odell Thorpe, and Ms. Clippy Young, whom are all now deceased, Reverend Roy Sykes, pastor at that time, created the Golden Circle Auxiliary, whose name later became Golden Circle Ministry. Eight presidents, some of whom served more than one term, worked diligently over the years to continue the common goals on which the ministry was founded. Each of the presidents built upon work laid by her sister before her. In the final analysis, one can readily see that the legacy begun by Pastor Sykes and these women was well planned and is a testament to their commitment to this ministry. Why? Because their work still stands and the ministry has survived. Among the many activities of the ministry were monetary donations to the sick and shut-in, provisions of sympathy cards during periods of bereavement, fundraisers such as bazaars were held, Christmas luncheons, cake walks, attendance at religious dramatizations such as Worthy is the Lamb, excursions were taken, and the purchase of altar flowers to name a few. The COVID-19 pandemic caused the ministry to modify its efforts. We reached out by delivering much needed bags filled with necessities to senior individuals. In keeping with Haggai chapter two, verse nine, which the following applies. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. We intend that through our beautification efforts, visitors and church members alike will encounter an atmosphere that will make it easy for them to sit back, relax, and enjoy the inner peace gained through a wonderful worship experience. As this ministry continues to grow in its quest to do God's work, we invite those of you who have, loved, who have a love for decorating and a vision for beauty of God's house to join us by contacting a Golden Circle member. At this time, I present Deaconess Lucy Munns, Minister Trey, who will come with the conclusion of our presentation. Good morning. Today we are here to honor four amazing women of First Baptist who God has called home in the last year. We will be lighting candles to lighting candles to first honor Deaconess Carolyn Trice Walker and Sister Edna Winston Utley. These first two women are members of the Golden Circle. We're members of the Golden Circle. They both serve as president of this ministry, and we will certainly miss these gu their guidance, and we will continue to do God's work. They were both dedicated to the ministry and to the church. We are honoring also two women whom God blessed to live past 100 years old, Miss Alice Holland Harris and Miss Julia May Burton Mims. They both migrated from Granville County to Wake County as did the founders of this church. They both attended First Baptist faithfully until their health did not allow them to do so. What a blessing to have them as part of our church, history, and family. I would like to leave you with a few words that describe these blessed women. 
I've traveled past you yet to walk, learned lessons old and new, and now this wisdom of my life I'm blessed to share with you. Let kindness spread like sunshine, embrace those who are sad, respect their dignity, give them joy and leave them feeling glad. Express what you are feeling, your belief you should uphold. Don't shy away from what is right. Be courageous and be bold. We would like for the family members of Deacon Carolyn Walker, uh, Sister Edna Utley, Mrs. Alice Harris, and Mrs. Julia May Mims to stand. If those families are here, you related to them, stand up. All right. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this special occasion with us today. We ask that God bless you and please come back and be with us very soon. And on behalf of our pastor, Reverend Larry and the First Baptist Church family, thank you for your support year round, all the time. We really do appreciate it. And this is the end of our anniversary. It's been 78 years. And you can tell by the way people are here and the love that we have spread it throughout the town and city around us. God is good. Thank you. Can we thank the Lord for the current president, Mrs. Lucy Marms? Oh, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. These ladies and gentlemen have done a wonderful job in this community, and we certainly do appreciate all that they've done. Thank God for a golden circle. Hallelujah. Their work in this community has been most impeccable. And I can't thank you enough, enough, ladies, gentlemen, those of you that serve on Golden Circle. Thank you so very much. I'm very humbled uh, to be the pastor of the church and to serve such wonderful ladies. They are always in the community doing wonderful things and serving in such a powerful way. Thank you once, once again. God bless. Now we would like to quote our theme for the year, if you will. We'd like to quote our theme, and it comes out of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. So I want you to quote with me what our theme is for the year. Each one, reach one. Y'all start over. Let's do that again. Each one, reach one. Let us quote the scripture for this year. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. This is our theme, and I want to say this to each and every one of you. When I say each one reach one, yes, that means bring people to church. Yes, that means win disciples. That means evangelize. But it means beyond that, go feed the hungry. Help those that are disenfranchised. Help somebody along the way who can't help themselves. Each one of you reach somebody else. Praise God. Praise God, my brothers and sisters. So at this time, we're ready for the word. We're going to have this choir to come back or this praise team to come back and minister to us. And, and after which I will bring a word as the Lord has commissioned me.
God is my everything. Hallelujah. Amen. I just needed to take a chill pill for a moment. Woo! <laughs> Because our God is worthy to be praised. He's worthy. He's worthy, worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Yes, you can. Hallelujah. I wonder if there's anybody that knows that God is. There is no doubt in your mind that God is. Hallelujah. My everything, my everything. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Pray.
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's all right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's worthy. He is worthy. He's worthy. It's all right to praise him. It is all right to praise him. Huh. Yes. Amen. Well, let me say good morning again, First Baptist. We just needed that moment to just celebrate the Lord in our own way. And it's all right to cry. It's all right, all right to lift your hand. It's all right to tell the Lord thank you. Because he's worthy to be praised. Praise be to his name. I am coming out of First Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We've been in chapter 13 for quite a few weeks now. I think 10 or 11 weeks we've been in chapter 13. It's a book full of love. But we're coming from verse 6. If you will, turn your Bibles to, uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. In the NIV version of the Bible, it says these words. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Can I say that again? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Let us take a moment as we prepare our hearts for what the Lord has to say to each and every one of us this morning. May we pray. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. Thankful to you for what we've experienced to this very point. Now, Lord, as we break the bread of life, we ask that you would speak to our hearts so that we will indeed understand what your word is saying to each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for being here this morning. Thank you that we celebrated Golden Circle for 70 plus years. And we honor you, Lord, for those ladies that we lit the candles for. for. We pray, dear Lord, that you bless their families in a special, special way. Thank God that they are here today. We ask that we always remember their legacy and what they've done in the life of this church. We praise you, Lord. Now, Lord, speak in your own way. Open up our hearts and minds, and may we hear what thus saith the Lord. Save a soul, make somebody whole. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we ask all of these things. And let everybody say, Amen. Amen. Today, I have entitled the sermon, Do Not Delight in Evil, But Truth. Do Not Delight in Evil, But Truth. My brothers and sisters, all of us that are sitting here today, we have a B.C. moment in our lives. We all have a B.C. life, and that's before Christ. And before Christ, we lived oftentimes the way we wanted to live. Yes, we may have done some right things, but oftentimes we did them wrong. And there was no conviction from the wrong that we did. 
our before life Christ, I'm going to talk about it in my sermon, but I want you to know that God in love waited on you. For the Bible tells us that God so loved, and he said so loved the world, so loved you, so loved me, and the entire world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life he took our, B our bc days and done away with it now we live a life for him in chapter 13 we find these important words that love does not delight in evil. What does that mean? Well, I want to just share with you some other translations in what it has to say. In the, new, new, the Good News translation, say love is not happy with evil, but it's happy with the truth. The International Standard Version it said, is, love is never glad with sin. She always, she's always glad to side with truth and please that truth will win. The new Matthew Bible says, love does not take pleasure in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And the voice says, Love, that, that it, uh, or may I say, it's, it's celebrate, it does not celebrate injustice, but truth, yes, truth, is love's delight. My brothers and sisters, in Corinth, there was a whole, there were a lot of problems in the life of the church. A whole lot of problems. It started with chapter one. The apostle Paul was told about all of the concerns of the church. And he wrote a letter that lasted for, in our estimation, 16 chapters. And he addressed each one of them. But one that I want to point out to you that brings home the fact that love does not rejoice when evil is done is in chapter 5 of 1 uh, Corinthians. And in chapter 5, there was, a, there was the sin of incest. Yes, incest. And this was a situation where a boy or a young man was laying with or having sexual relations with his father's wife. Not his mother, but his stepmother. But yet, it was a sin. The Bible tells us, if you read chapter 5, that uh, uh, they were doing these kinds of things in the church. They said that even the heathen thought it was despicable, and they would not even do those kinds of things. In other words, unbelievers did not gravitate toward that kind of sin. I want you to know today that Paul rebuked them. But the important thing that we need to understand, they were proud of the way that they were living. They were glad about it, and they even boasted. Look at chapter 5, starting with verse 1. They boasted about that kind of sin. But I stopped by here today to tell you the Bible is clear that when we love, when we have God's love in our hearts, sin should be atrocious to us. Sin should be despicable to us. And when we see it, we ought to call it out. Paul pointed out in chapter 5, you ought to be rebuking this brother for his behavior. You see, sin is more than just a, um, excuse me, love is more than just a feeling. Yes, you say, I feel love. I, I, uh, 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 before my, my before evil's time, a girl asked me, how did I know that I loved her? I couldn't even tell her. I said, I just feel it. It's more than a feeling. It's more than a feeling. Uh, in the Greek, that word love, that agape, that word love is action. And it's an action verb means that you do something. So if you tell a brother or a sister that I love you, if they are in need of something, they need food on their table, before they hear the gospel of Christ, you may have to feed them. You may have to nurture them. You may have to do something. It's an action verb. It's action, not 
just words. Oh, you going to, oh, bless your brother. Go on your way. I, 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 you know, I'm going to pray for you. No, they need more than prayer. They need for you to do something about their situation. And then maybe they'll hear the gospel from you. My brothers and sisters, this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about. This brother was doing something in the life of the church, and the church would not call him out. And they, the church was proud of those kinds of sins. Can I just point out some other sins? In chapter 1, the Bible points out that there was divisiveness in the church. Is there divis divisiveness in the church today? Uh, I, I've seen church divide up, or may I say part, or uh, split up and become two churches simply because people could not get along with one another. There was divisiveness in the Corinthian church. They were divided, and the way that Paul was talking about it, he said it shouldn't be this way. You all need to come together as brothers and sisters in unity and in love. Provoke one another to love and to good works. My brothers and sisters, not only that, uh, was there uh, divisiveness in the church, but also some of them were carnal in their actions. And when I say carnal, that word carnal means they were worldly. Yes, they were naming the name of Christ, but they were worldly. They were living like the world. They were not living the life of Christ in many cases. They had been blessed in more ways than you can say, and yet they were living like the world. And the Apostle Paul said, you should not be carnal. You should not be worldly. You ought to be living a holy life. You ought to be living the life of Christ. If Christ has transformed you, if he washed you in the blood of the Lamb, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if he pulled you out of that muck and that miry clay, then you ought to live like it. You ought to live like it. So there was divisiveness. There was sin in the life. They were living like the world. Not only were they living like the, like the world, there was so much going on in this church that uh, Paul had to write this letter to tell them that you are act, not acting in love. You're not showing love. You're not showing the love of God. The love of God is not manifested in your life. If anything, you're showing more hatred than love. You're not showing the ways of Christ. No, because love covers all their sin. Yes, you've been boastful. You've been proud. You see, they misunderstood something significant in chapter 5 and, and the entire book itself. You see, they misunderstood what grace is all about. Yes, they misunderstood their freedom in Christ. They misunderstood. See, God's grace, our freedom in Christ is not a license to do whatever we want to do. Paul said in the book of Romans, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, no. Yes, sir. If God has transformed you, sin ought to be despicable in your sight, just like it is in the sight of God. Yes, and if you've got the character of God in you, sin ought to trouble you when you do wrong. And if it doesn't trouble you, you need to check yourself. You need to do a self-examination. And see if you are in the Lord. Yes, but God's grace, God's freedom. We are free. The Bible says, he that the Son hath set free. Y'all know the scripture. He is free. He or she is free indeed. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I tell you, God's grace, yes, sir, doesn't give us a license uh, uh, to sin. We don't have a license to go out and do like we want. I'm saved now. Now I can go out here and just do my own thing. No, no, no. Uh, you won't get away with it without consequences. Uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. All right, to think like that about sin, if you will, that you have a license to think like that is to, uh, to, to misunderstand what grace is all about. So, my brother, so what is grace? Well, if I were to ask you that question, I, most, I think many of you probably can tell me. But I want to put it in this word. My answer to grace is this. Grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. Did y'all hear what I said? I said grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. You don't deserve God's grace. But he applied it to your life anyway. You see, true grace is when Jesus takes uh, take sinful, polluted, 
rotten to the core people, people like you and me, who have plenty of faults and failings and corrupt baggage, and he gives to us what we do not deserve. Hallelujah. In him, we find forgiveness. In him, he takes us where he wants us to be. And there is the promise of a new start when we come to Christ in faith. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things, I said all things, everything, all things become new. So he gives you a new start. He gives you a new life. Not because you deserved it, not because you earned it, but simply because of his grace toward us. Did y'all hear what I said? Oh, there was a posting in Facebook. Uh, yes, I, I, I look at Facebook sometimes, y'all, because I get a lot of information. But there was a posting in Facebook that, that talked about the difference between grace and works. We talked about grace. We talked about faith and works in Sunday school this morning. Y'all need to come to Sunday school. Y'all missed some good stuff. Praise God. But anyway, uh, talked about grace and works between the Christian faith and the religions of the world. Well, y'all remember Mahatma Gandhi? Mahatma Gandhi acknowledged the inability of his religion to atone uh, for sin. And despite his moral lifestyle, he lived a good lifestyle. Good moral lifestyle. Uh, and, and all of his good works. He admitted, uh, it is a constant torture to me that I am still so far from him whom I know to be my very life and being. I know it is my own wretchedness and wickedness that keeps me from him. That's a quote. But the real tragedy for Gandhi, my brothers and sisters, is contained in his autobiography. He wrote in his autobiography that during his student days, he read the Gospels seriously and considered converting to Christianity. He believed that in, he believed that in the teachings of Jesus, he could find the solution to the caste system that was uh, dividing the people in India. So one Sunday, he decided to go to church. He decided to attend a service at a nearby church and to talk to the minister about becoming a Christian. And when he entered the sanctuary, however, the usher refused to give him a seat and suggested that he go worship with his own people. Gandhi left the church and never returned. He wrote these words, if Christians have caste differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu. That ushers prejudice, that ushers discrimination, that ushers way of treating somebody who comes to the church, betray Jesus and betray the cause of Christ. But also, uh, to, uh, to turn a, a person like Gandhi, and how many people turn, get turned away, but it turned a person away from trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, I had a Gandhi experience. I'm thankful to the Lord that I didn't let that be my last church that I went to. But I went to a church one time. Even though they were smiling in my face, I saw the hypocrisy in their way of treatment of me. And I tell you, my brothers and sisters, we need to be careful how we treat other folk because you might be responsible for that person losing their soul as a result of the way that you treated them. He had, a, because of Gandhi, did not experience the love, the love of Christians. Do you express love toward others? Not only in the church, but in your community. What about your neighbors? What about that ugly neighbor who tells you not to cut you? You cut your, my grass one inch over. You need to move over an inch because you cut in my grass and then you go out there and fuss with them about that. Oh, say, oh, my bad, my bad. You know, you can be loving 
What about that coworker who mistreats you? As I indicated the other week, may have stopped you from getting a promotion or stopped something good from happening to you, but you can still spread the love of Christ. Uh, love does not, does, doesn't do anything evil. I stopped by here to tell you today, my brothers and sisters, evil for evil, do, do not render evil for evil. If somebody does evil toward you, you do good. If somebody does bad towards you, you pray for them. Yes, you don't, don't despise them. If somebody despises you, do right by them. And God will bless you in a mighty way. I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but we need to understand uh, that, that, that God wants us to love other people, whether they are other, uh, of other religions. Uh, but the religion of good works will not work it out. We've got to be saved by the grace of Almighty God. I don't know about you. We found forgiveness, and we need to extend forgiveness. We found love. We need to extend love. We need to let the love of Christ extend, be extended to us. Any of y'all remember your before Christ days? <laughs> Some of you were slanderers. Some of you were boastful and proud and trying to swindle people out of whatever. Some of you were drunkards and uh, drug addicts and whatever your life may have been. But the love of Christ, but for the love of Christ, uh, that picked you up and turned you around and placed your feet on solid ground. Stop hating on folk and say that you love God. God's grace, our freedom in Christ is not a license for us to do wrong. I tell you, my brothers and sisters, but it is a license for us to do right. A little girl, there was a little story about a little girl. She got saved and applied uh, for a membership in a church. So she was interviewed by two of the elders of the church. And uh, so she was interviewed, when she was interviewed by these two elders, they asked her, were you a sinner? She said, yes. They asked her, are you still a sinner? She said, yes. They asked her, then what real changes have taken place in your life? She replied, the best way I can explain that, explain is that I used to be a sinner, running after sin but now I'm a sinner running away from sin <laughs> did y'all hear what I said you see these uh, Corinthian Christians were real trophies of grace they had been saved by God's grace they had been wonderfully converted but yet they were taking the advantage of grace and grace is not to be taken advantage of, my brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul said in chapter 6 uh, that, that uh, some of their lifestyles uh, before Christ where they were thieves, they were wicked, they were drunkards, they were slanderous. They were, swim they were all kinds of things. They even served idol gods. But God in his mercy still, he looked down on them with mercy and he did some mighty wonderful things in their life and changed them forever. You see, the good news uh, uh, met them right where they were and saved them and pulled them up and out of their situation. I want you to notice in chapter 6 what it said is that, they, that, that some of them were like that. <laughs> I, were you like that? <laughs> uh, some of you were a certain way. Some of you were that way. But God, in his grace, he took you out of that. And now you're a changed person. You're different than you've ever been. You're better than you've ever been. Not that you're boasting about it, but thanks be to God, he's made a change in my life, in your life. And if you've been changed, that change ought to show in your attitude, in your actions toward others, especially when it comes to loving. We've been talking about love a long time. Y'all tired of talking about love? <laughs> we, gonna, we got a few more sermons on love. Praise God. Uh, that's God's grace. God's grace. Uh, I, I like one of our sisters back here sings about God's grace. What God's grace can do for you. How God's grace forgave you. How God's grace covers you every day. The grace of God didn't stop at the saving of you. But you, if you woke up this morning, while you slumber and slept, it was nothing but the grace of God. Oh yes, yes, he was watching over you all night long. If you don't have any pain in your body, even if you do have pain, it's the grace of God that keeps you, that molds you, that continues to make you. Thank God for his amazing, amazing grace. He continues to forgive us. 
He continues to forgive us. I want you to, I want to give you a story, a quick, another little quick story. I want you to look at this as a matter of grace. I want you to imagine a man involved in a serious car accident. And uh, this man was involved in a serious car accident. He rushed to the hospital in, in critical condition. And the odds against him, uh, and, and, and it looked like he was about to die, if you will. But due to the intervention of skilled surgeon, uh, the man is not only uh, uh, saved from death, but uh, in time, his scars even healed, and he is, in good, he's, he is as good as new, my brothers and sisters. But now imagine the same man, a few months later, uh, gets in his car, and he says, I'm going to go out and deliberately crash this car hard into the wall as hard as I can because I want to show you how good the surgeon and the hospital is. You and I would look at that man and say he must be insane. You see, hospitals and surgeons and, and surgeons and nurses and the caregivers, they are not there to deal with people's stupidity. Yes, they are there to serve people, the needy, the vulnerable, the sick. They are there for healing purposes, not for us to get out here and do something stupid. You see, I want to apply that to God's grace. God done pulled you out of all of that mess. You know how you live your life, and the Lord has done a mighty work. And then you're going to go back out here and say, well, I'm going to take God's grace for granted. And I'm going to go out here and crash my life again. I'm going to go out here and be a drunkard again. I'm going to go out here and do all of this crazy. God didn't give his grace for your stupidity. Oh, my brothers and sisters, oh, God has set us on a new direction. And God has set us on a, a direction that where we're getting closer to him. We ought to be getting better and stop making excuses about how we're living and live the best life we can. Give our lives over to the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to take control of every aspect of our life. And we will be all right, my brothers and sisters. Yes, grace is the way. Love is the way. Love is the way. So I want, you to, I want to say to you today, love does not delight in wrongdoing. But Lowry, I want to say it, it said it different at the end of the verse, but my translation, love delights in right doing. It doesn't delight in wrongdoing, but God wants us to live right. God wants us to do right. Do right by others. Do right by yourself. Let your light so shine that people may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Are you living right? Are you doing right? Or are you glorifying sin? Are you allowing sin to take residence in your heart and life? Are you allowing sin in your home? Then I declare unto you, you need to allow God to take over your home, take over your life, take over your spirit so that you can live in such a way that pleases him. My brothers and sisters, do not delight in evil, in injustices, the injustices that we see in our world today. Black against white, white against black. You see housing injustices. See all, see the Bible said it doesn't rejoice. It doesn't, it has no pleasure in injustices in the court and wherever else. We need to do right by all people because I'm going to tell you something. You're sitting here today. Every one of us is going to have to give an account to God for how we live, how we treated people. Were you kind? Were you patient? Did you love them unequivocally? Did you love them with the agape love, the God kind of love, that unconditional love, the love that never quits? Hallelujah, somebody. Oh, so in my final analysis, I want to just quote a poem with you, uh, and then I'm going to get ready to close. I like the poem that the, the one lady wrote that goes like this. My face in the mirror isn't wrinkled or drawn. My house isn't dirty. The cobwebs are gone. My garden looks lovely, and so does my lawn. I think I might never put my glasses back on. <laughs> see, my brothers and sisters, <laughs> you have dirty glasses. <laughs> yes, sir, you won't see your life. Uh, you have dirty uh, life. You can't see because of the cloud uh, and you are living a certain way. My brothers and sisters, the truth revealed in the book uh, of, 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 of 1 Corinthians for the Christian, it is uh, designed for application. We are supposed to apply the principles of God's word to our life. You don't just read it. You're supposed to make it applicable to your life. Yes, make it applicable 
to your life. So my translation, love does not delight in wrongdoing, but in right doing. Do right, my brothers and sisters. In almost every chapter of the book of Corinth, it's about wrong. And I pointed that out to you earlier. I want you to notice that in chapter 1, he talked about division. But what, what can we do about division, my brothers and sisters? We can have unity in the life of the church. He talked about division. Not only that, he talked about uh, worldly wisdom and carnality. And if you want to get rid of worldly wisdom, then do have the wisdom of Almighty God. He talked about the problem of carnality, and you want to get rid of that, then have the attitude and the example of Jesus Christ, because he set the ultimate example to us. In chapter 5, he talked about immorality. You want to clean up immorality, then do what's right. Be faithful to your wife. Be faithful to your husband. Uh, those of us who are uh, uh, loved, of, uh, maybe you're having some, some concerns and you may have to get it together but in anyway he goes on to talk about in chapter 6 that, that, that uh, taking uh, brothers and sisters to court we ought to be able to work out our differences that's what the Bible tells us work out our issues between one another and not to let those little acorns grow into huge immovable trees See, my brother and sister, in chapter 6, he talked about the problem of fornication. Uh, if you are living true to God, therefore, you want to be sexually pure. Oh, I don't hear nothing. I, I, I must be stepping on somebody's toe. <laughs> we need to be sexually pure. Uh, he talked about, in chapter 7, uh, about divorce and marriage, or marriage and divorce. You want to, but, but we need to look at the prescriptions of God's word and follow God's guidelines for marriage. And yes, and truth for living, he talks about the problem of offering meats to idols in chapter 8. And listen what it says. It, it, uh, uh, but in order to, uh, we, if we want to live true to God's word, we need to have a clear conscience before Almighty God. Then he talked about in chapter 11, the roles between men and women. But I want you to know today, God in his amazing grace there is no difference between there is no divisiveness there is no difference between a man and a woman except we are different in our biology but in the eyes of God we are all the same we need to remember that my brothers and sisters yes we're equal we're equal he talked about them abusing the Lord's Supper in chapter 11 but he said uh, to, to them that if you come to church to take communion uh, examine your own heart and if you need to repent repent before you take the supper huh before you break bread make sure that you repent and then in chapter 4 12 he talked about misusing our spiritual gifts because some people they gloat in their own giftedness but I stopped by here to tell you today uh, if you want to live true to Almighty God you need to understand that your spiritual gifts were given to you as a tool to be used for God and not for yourself huh uh, this is not toys that we play with. This is not something that we just sit up and look what I can do. Praise God. It's all about God. And we need to remember that. In chapter 13, he talked about the problem of a lack of love. And yes, sir, but if we are going to live true, we need to remember that love is the glue that binds everything together. And without love, we don't have anything of lasting value. Two more chapters, three more chapters on this situation. He talked about in chapter 14, the problem of misusing the gift of speaking in tongues. And, uh, but if we're going to live true to the word of God, we need to remember that when this gift is used, it's for the benefit of others. It's to build up the church. Chapter 15, you have the problem with wrong teaching. And true for living is to study the scriptures, which encourages us and rebukes us and corrects us. It tells us to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. And in chapter 16, you have a problem with collecting for the saints. And if we're going to live true to God's word, we need to be aware of our part in giving to the purpose of God in this world you see we give our money for the extension of the kingdom of God yes right here don't be so stingy you know you God loves a cheerful giver and so my brothers and sisters in summary I want you to understand this uh, uh, chapter 6 uh, verse 6 rather is divided into two parts it's like right versus wrong 
is like evil versus truth. And I want you to understand that the first part is negative. He's told us to do not delight in evil. That's the negative part. But the second part is delight in the truth. This, uh, yes, so my translation, I say do, do not delight in wrongdoing, but delight in right doing. Do right, my brothers and sisters. Do right. Live right. Live a life that pleases God. Live in such a way that God is happy with your life. But do the right thing and live the right way. And let your actions speak louder than your words. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. If everybody stand right where you are, we open the doors of the church. If there's one today who doesn't know Jesus Christ, and maybe you're listening to me online, God sees your heart and he knows you better than all. And if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, then we ask that you walk this aisle today to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior. If that's you, then don't be afraid to step out in the aisle. Say, yes, I need to be saved. I need the Lord to forgive me of my sins. I need the Lord to change my life. And I'm, gonna, I'm asking him now. He'll receive you. He will accept you. He will change your life. He'll make you whole. He will save you from where you are. He'll save you so that you can be on your way to heaven. That's you today. And for those of you that listen online, if you want to call, someone will answer the phone. And they'll walk you through the plan of salvation. Our phone number is 919-552-9151. Five, zero. You could call and someone would talk to you about your salvation. If that's you today, we invite you to come right now. Perhaps there's someone else that would like to join First Baptist Church. And if you want to join, you are saved, but you say, I don't belong to a church in this community and I need to be connected. Then I want you to come right now to join First Baptist. We'll be happy to have you. I'm going to give you a moment to respond to this gospel choir. The choir is going to sing and you respond to this gospel call. Praise the Lord. Those that desire your prayer, just slip your hand up right where you are. We're not going to walk the aisle. We just want you to slip your hand up. The Lord sees your hands. He knows. You can take your hands down now. We're going to pray about the concerns of your heart. Perhaps you're standing in proxy for someone that's not here. Perhaps you're standing for a co-worker or a child or a grandchild or a loved one or a spouse or a who, whoever, a neighbor or whoever it might be or somebody that you are concerned about. Maybe somebody is sick. Maybe somebody just lost a loved one. Perhaps wherever it is, God knows all about it. Maybe it's your own health, your own situation. The Lord sees and understands and knows all about it. With every head bowed, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come before your throne once again. You saw the hands that went up and you know their circumstances and their situations. But God, we pray that you would meet them right where they are. Bring healing and wholeness men relationships take them from where they are to where you want them to be give peace of mind that peace that surpasses all understanding some are celebrating lord in such a way of loved ones that may have gone on some have may have lost loved ones recently and need your undergirding love that love that only you can give to sustain them at a time like this. Some may be suffering in their body and just need your sustaining presence. For we recognize in, in Isaiah, for by your stripes we are 
healed. We thank you, Lord. Somebody might be praying for other needs in their life that they know that only you can fix and make us whole. Take us where you want us to be. We give your name praise, Lord, for being the great I am in all of our lives. I pray, Lord, that you will cover them with your love. Cover them with your grace. Cover them with the freedom that only you can give. That freedom that we experienced when we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. This is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' most precious name. We indeed do pray. And let everyone say, Amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Say amen one more time. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in the house. You may take your seats. You may take your seats. At this time, we're going to have the ushers come forward and uh, to take up our offering. For those of you that are listening online, there are two ways you can do this. If you'd like to support us, you can send your offerings to First Baptist Fuquay. Fuquay is spelled F-U-Q-U-A-Y. You can send it to Post Office Box 432. Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina, 27526. Also, if you desire, you can go to our website, firstbaptistfuquay.com, and you can click on PayPal, and you can give that way. Now the choir is going to minister to us by song as we take our offering at this time. Let us bow our heads and prepare for offertory of prayer. Eternal and all wise creator, we come to you first to say thank you. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy that you have shown us and allowed us to be here at this appointed time. We thank you for allowing us to give this offering back to you. And we ask that you use it as you see fit for the building of thy kingdom. And Father God, bless each and every giver of this offering, both in person and both 
by way of other ask by way of phone or whatever. Now, Father God, bless it as you see fit again. And bless each and every household throughout this land. And bless those who are less fortunate, dear God. For it is in Jesus' name that we claim the victory and the blessings. And let us all say, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. I want to encourage those of you that are here today to come to Sunday school. You'll, you'll be blessed uh, on Sunday mornings at 930. And I also want to encourage you to come to Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We're in James chapter 2. I think we pick up on verse 9. And so we would love for you to come uh, read the rest of that chapter in chapter 2 of James. We certainly would appreciate it. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory to the only wise God our Savior be dominion power majesty both now and forevermore let everybody say Go in peace, my brothers and sisters.